Hey friends, and welcome to Typology, the show on which we explore the story of you through the lens of the Enneagram. Super happy to have you here. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. We've got a great guest today. She's actually Ian's editor, and so there is a lot to talk about. Today's guest is Jana Reese. Jana holds degrees in religion from Wesley College and Princeton Theological Seminary and a PhD in American religious history from Columbia University. She speaks often to media about issues pertaining to religion in America and has been interviewed by the Associated Press, Time, Newsweek, People, Boston Globe, USA Today, on and on and on. She's authored and co-authored many books, including The Prayer Wheel, Flunking Sainthood. So we have a lot of great things to discuss today. So glad you're here. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now, here is the host of our show, Ian Crumb. Enneagram One, my friend, my editor, my grammar guru, Jana Reese, welcome to Typology. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. We, I have so looked forward to this conversation. Uh, I want everybody to know that you and I worked together on the road back to you. We worked intensely together on uh, the story of you as well. We have spent countless hours together uh, working on books. And I, as I tell people over and over and over again, I could not do this without Jana Reese. Wow. Thank you. That is uh, music to my ears, and it's been a total, total joy. Mm. Well, for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so there are those stressful times, but it's been so great. And, you know, thank you for valuing the work that I do, valuing what it means to be an editor, because, you know, there are a lot of writers because it's your book, right? You know, it's the thing that you're pouring your life energy into. And it's hard to be edited. It's hard to have somebody sending something back with all of the red comments and saying, let's move this here. And you really don't need that. And Ian, you are just so open to that. You're, you're mm. so welcoming of it. So thank you. I, early on in my writing, uh, I think it was when I worked with Dave Lambert, who was also a great editor, uh, worked with him on two books. And I learned very early, maybe from the publisher, as a rule, trust your editor. And that that has really served me well. Um, if you have a good editor, just trust them. Even if it hurts to take out paragraphs that you love, just trust them that it's the right thing to do. And I've never I've never had that bite me, uh, you know, in the rear end at any point uh, with you and Dave. So fantastic, um, Janet. You are an Enneagram one. You have done a lot of work with me uh, writing about the Enneagram. I know offline you've done a lot of work studying the, the Enneagram. Just talk to me a little bit about the beginning of your journey when you discovered the Enneagram and what it was like to find out you were a one. It was hard. Um, so Years ago, I had some friends at InterVarsity Press who were very excited about the Enneagram, and they eventually were the publishers of The Road Back to You. Um, and so I would see them at these conferences because I work in the publishing industry. And uh, at first, when I was learning about it, we thought maybe I was a three. Threes are very achievement oriented. They're very task oriented. I am both of those things. But uh, actually, shortly before I started working with you on this book, I went to an Enneagram retreat where I live in Cincinnati. And we did threes. Some of it didn't sound like me at all, like the, the ability to kind of be flexible, to be so adaptable, or even to, to embellish the truth, you know, to, to sort of embellish your own accomplishments. I find that sort of offensive, you know, mm -hmm. I would never do something like that. And then we got to the one and I just completely recognized the good, the bad and the ugly in what that meant in, in to be a one and the perfectionism and how it can make you and it makes it's great for editing, right? Because that's what you have to do, uh, be very detail oriented, but it can be absolutely crippling in your own spiritual development. It can be hard on relationships if you're an overly critical person. And so I remember sitting there at the retreat and just feeling seen, but in a very uncomfortable way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was when I began to realize 
what it meant to be a one and started to do research about mm-hmm. it. You know, I think people have different responses when they hear their type. I mean, the typical teacher thing is, oh, you'll know your type when you start to feel queasy inside, right? Like someone's reading your mail and it doesn't feel good because you're hearing stuff about your, yourself that's not always very awesome, right? Um other types, I think, have a different response. Uh, for me as a four, I felt relief. Mm. I, I felt like, oh, finally, I feel understood. I feel seen. I feel like also there's a roadmap to, to greater healing. And of course, I didn't like hearing that I was self-absorbed, that I was overly fixated on my own feelings and stuff, but I knew that already, you, you know, and, <laughs> and, and I didn't really need, you know, it's like, yeah, well, that's true. But that said, I, I really, I think people do have different responses. I think three, sevens and eights, sometimes their response is, yeah, rock on. Totally. That's who I am. They don't, they don't necessarily feel bad. Though I have seen threes feel bad if if it's taught you know with an edge, um, but definitely sevens and eights are like that's totally me and and why would I want to change anything you know it's yeah you know, just different responses from from different types of people. We were talking earlier and um, you said that early in life you you can actually look back and 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 see where your oneness right your improverness. Uh, began to blossom and you could actually sort of see it. Tell me about that. Well, so it was a bit of a, you know, challenging childhood. My father had mental illness. Ironically, Mm -hmm. he was a psychologist. So uh, I think that that was kind of an interesting dynamic, but there was a lot of tumult and chaos that culminated in him just leaving very unexpectedly when I was about 14. So I remember when he left, feeling that total dislocation, feeling so abandoned, concerned about the financial future, because he basically took everything, including our college savings. I mean, it was just a lot of of, uh, uncertainty. And and my mother being left alone, um, feeling kind of responsible for for her experience and for helping her being, being as helpful as I could to her. But I remember cleaning my room like thinking, I can't really do anything about those things, but I can organize my room and I can get good grades at school and Mm -hmm. try to do whatever I can to not be a burden to my mom uh, and be responsible. And there had been other experiences up to that point, but I think that's the one that I look back on as being particularly pivotal. Mm -hmm. Like, this is how I'm going to resolve anxiety is I'm going to organize my space and try to organize my life and try to be as helpful to other people as I can. Mm. Try to be as good as you, as you, right. Cause I think I'm just tweaking the language there because I think twos would say helpful. And I think ones would say, I just want to be as good as I can, you know? And, yeah. and I also think one of the things you just mentioned that is important is, you know, about the cleaning of the room is, is a good metaphor for it, which is that I think, Eights, nines, and ones are very concerned with issues around mastery and control. Mm -hmm. And what you were describing is if I can just get control and master others in the environment and be good and do things perfectly and not make mistakes and and avoid fault and blame, then I'll have some element of control in this life. Life won't be overwhelming and unpredictable and scary. Right. And I think that's a, a very compassionate way to describe ones uh, that sometimes we seem like control freaks. We own it, right? We're control freaks in whatever. For me, it's more about my environment than it is about controlling people, at least I hope. Um, But it comes from a place of needing to feel like we are good people Mm -hmm. and needing to feel like life is not chaos. And so sometimes if we go overboard it's, it's from a place of, of you know, it's, it's from a, a loving place, but mm. other people don't necessarily hear that in a loving way. And that's totally understandable. Yeah. And it's also born of a broken story, isn't it? Yes. You yes, know, it is. <clears throat> we, I just want to, uh, you know, in the story of you, which we work so hard on, you know, uh, here's how I, we describe it. So um, the improver ones are honest, conscientious, detail-oriented, self-disciplined, and morally heroic people. 
The underlying false premise of their story is the mistaken belief that the world loves and rewards only the good people and judges the bad ones. If you're trapped in the improver's story, you try to gain love and a sense of control by tamping down your anger, meeting your own high internal standards, and seeking to perfect yourself, others, and the world. Mm-hmm. Does, does that kind of capture the, the broken story that you began to inhabit as, as a little person? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I can definitely look back on childhood as a series of attempts to control my environment and be good so that I wasn't going to add additional stress to the adults around me who were already very, very stressed mm-hmm. with circumstances of their lives and, you know, particularly dealing with mental illness. So, yeah, you know, being the good kid, being the one that was um, not going to get in trouble. In fact, (laughs) in high school, I went on on this school trip where some of the kids were smoking marijuana in the hotel room. And one of them was my roommate. It wasn't a roommate that I had particularly known or been friends with. She was just assigned to room with three other people. And she was smoking marijuana in our room. And I actually turned her in. I mean, here I am like 15 or 16. And I found a teacher and I said, you know, so-and-so is smoking marijuana. And I don't want that to happen in our room. Well, what I didn't know at the time was that actually there were a lot of kids, including some of the the power brokers of whatever, you know, Midwestern high school social uh, hierarchy exists. And so it kind of was a big deal. And I didn't know any of that. If I had known, I don't think I would have made any move to, you know, have all of this this uh, terrible censure heaped upon me. Um, but it was a bit of a defining moment, also, mm-hmm. because I think that people tend to become what other people think they're going to be. You know, and you mentioned this phrasing of moral heroism. You know, morally heroic ones thrive on that stuff. You know, that's the kind of thing that that we want to be. And so there was also this part of me, even though I really regretted the decision to turn this kid in, it was stupid, um, was very selfishly motivated. On the other hand, I liked that feeling of teachers coming up to me in the hallway and saying, oh, you know, good for you. Good for you for standing up to this. Uh, This was the Nancy Reagan era, right, of just say no. So that was absolutely in the air. Anyway, you be, you become what other people think you are or what they express that they need from you. Mm. And we also train people to anticipate, right? Like um, yeah. that's also part of the problem is that we, by virtue of our actions, we train people to expect certain things from us. And so there's this sort of conversation that goes on between us and, and, and others, uh, and which makes sometimes the journey of transformation difficult because other people are like, wait a minute, who are you now? Like you're changing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's when we encounter resist resistance, right. To, to transformation. Right. If the one suddenly starts acting out or being a bad person, however, the one would have described that, that is very surprising to people. You know, Mm. in, in the Enneagram, we talk about ones having a trap door. And so that this is sort of a, an acceptable path in their minds where if there's dualistic thinking going on, they think, well, I could uh, do this thing that I hate, as Paul would say, uh, secretly, right? I'm going to have this double life. And all of the news stories about televangelists or something that are uh, acting this out in a very public way, you know, my, my story about that is not at all dramatic, but I do remember when I was a kid, every year I went to the same summer camp and I loved it. It was fantastic. But at summer camp, my name was Kathy. So my name is Jana Catherine. And I, for whatever reason, said I wanted to be known as Kathy. And it was like at camp, Kathy was fun. Kathy was a seven. Kathy was totally fun loving and up for whatever and midnight, you know, raids on the latrine, sending, you know, somebody to go off to do a prank, Kathy was totally there. And Jana was a serious kid who read tons of books and always was doing the thing that was expected. So it is interesting. I mean, that's not a terrifically dramatic story of a trapdoor, but I think it kind of was the dynamic in my mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, 
the, I think the person, and, and maybe some of our listeners won't remember this guy, but was Ted Haggard. I think yes. I think Ted Haggard was the classic one. You, you just look at him and you can get a sense. And, you know, just preaching, you know, well, of course, he mm. was doing a lot of preaching against uh, homosexuality and same-sex attraction and marriage. And he just doubled down on it all the time. So much so that even I remember listening to him going, man, this dude protesteth too much. It's almost <laughs> like it's pretty clear that there's something going on here, right? And of course, you know, he's he's all about family values and, and all that stuff uh, back in the James Dobson days, et cetera. And um, then it comes out that he's been secretly traveling down to Denver where he's having a relationship with his male masseuse and mm-hmm. smoking crack. I mean, you couldn't I, I remember hearing that and going, no, 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 that's not even possible. But there's the trap door of the one. It's like they tamp down all that raw, instinctual energy. Often it's sexual energy. Sometimes it's just naughty energy. It's like I got to, I I am so good in every area of my life. I need, need one place because I kind of deserve it. A place where I can go, but it's got to be in secret because I got to be good. I want everybody to see me as good. And so, but I got to have a little secret thing on the side, you know? And so, I meet ones who are trapped in pornography or they drink at home just, but only at night, never in the car, but they have a drinking problem, but it's at home or, you know, on and on and on. And I think that's because of tamping down instinctual energy and anger. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to talk too long on this, but I think it's so important for our, our, our listeners to understand this about ones um, that, I, I was working with a, a young pastor of a, he had really built a big church and he was a one and struggling. And I asked him one time, I said, when do you let loose? Like what? And he said, well, I just have to confess this. And he had so much shame. I could see it coming. Right. And he's like, I like to chew tobacco. And I was like, and, and of course my first answer was that's all you got. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was like, he says, but I really need to stop. And, you know, he was like 25. And I know everyone's going to say that this was a really dumb thing to say, but maybe not. I said, he said, I really got to stop. I go, don't rush it. I said, you need to intentionally, I said, tell me something naughty you'd like to do. He says, I've always wanted a motorcycle and a ride with a bunch of guys. And you know what I mean? I said, go buy the motorcycle right now. Find some ways to let your shadow out that isn't going to actually upend you later in life. Mm -hmm. Like actually go find the shadow and experiment with it. And so he got a motorcycle. He joined a little club, not a gang, but a bunch of doctors and lawyers who wrote, got leathers and he chewed tobacco and rode his bike on Saturdays with all these guys. And I was like, you totally need that. You, you got to go someplace and, (laughs) and not be good. One of the things that I love about the Enneagram is this idea that it provides you with a path for growth. Mm-hmm. And for me, that is trying to consciously go to the high side of seven and the high side of four. So four is our stress number. Uh, for me, maybe if, if it's a negative space, that's like crawling under the covers, crying, listening to Sarah McLaughlin songs for hours. <laughs> if I'm upset about, it, you know, that has happened. But But it also is about getting in touch with feelings. And for ones, because we we tend to shunt those aside, we're doing in the moment, we are very focused on whatever the present task is, getting in touch with feelings is super important. And then for seven, it is about having a healthy way to have fun and, you know, to enjoy life, to really understand that life is meant to be lived to the fullest, meant to be lived abundantly. Uh, because if we don't have that mentality, we, we we could wind up like Ted Haggard. We could wind up with, you know, this this terrible sense of repression. Um, I think it's really important to think about the gifts of the seven and the gifts of the four and what they can do to help a one be more well rounded. Mm. I love that you, um, you know, that Kathy had such a. There's a clear delineation of you going to camp. And that expression of the seven in safety and security and health, yes. um, did it help you really uh, acknowledge, oh, there's this other part of me that I can access when I need to or want to? You know, I think it did. Um, I don't know that I would have had words to 
express that at the time. But what I knew at the time was that at camp, I could be so much more fun mm -hmm. to be around and so much less serious. You know, there were no expectations about who I would be or how I would behave. And so in that context, I really enjoyed just exploring what it was like to be this fun, loving, free spirit at camp. And it was funny too, because, you know, back then you didn't have social media, you didn't have cell phones. And so it was possible to be a different person at camp at age 13 or whatever. Um, in a way, it wouldn't be today. But I did keep in touch a lot with my friends from camp, and some of them came to visit me. And it was interesting to, first of all, have them say, I can't get used to you as a Jana. You know, like, I just don't see you as a Jana. Mm -hmm. And that's because they didn't see that side of me. Mm -hmm. That's so cool because I think, oh, well, I'll ask this question. You're no longer at camp, but can you every now and then intentionally say, today, I'm Kathy. You know, sometimes, especially when I'm on vacation, travel is, uh, you know, travel and reading are my two favorite pastimes. And I spend a lot of time uh, just dreaming about where I'm going to go. That's kind of tapping into the seven of dreaming into fun events and future possibilities. And when I'm away, I want to experience everything. I want to fully understand a culture and be curious about it in a way that is not um not necessarily associated with the one, you know, it's not about being perfect. It's just about living and enjoying life. Mm. So maybe it's time to have that extra margarita and take up ballroom dancing or something like that every now and then. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I do think that's important for ones, right? Well, I just, I just uh, described in the, how in the book, we came up with that old story of the broken story of the one. I just read that. So let me just read to you what we wrote about the new story to improver one. Okay. New storied improver ones realize that God's love for them is not predicated on their accomplishments in perfecting themselves, others in the world. That's the underlying premise of their old soul crushing narrative. They'll know they're living in a new story when they become more conscious of the passion of anger that has ruled their lives and naturally begin to experience the virtue of serenity that comes when they accept that the world is perfectly imperfect. And mm -hmm. so are they. They can be both riven and redeemed. Be encouraged, improvers. Most of your mistakes are misdemeanors, not felonies. Mm -hmm. as, as Julia Child once said, if you're alone in the kitchen and you drop the lamb, you can always just pick it up. Who's going to know? <laughs> 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 Where are you on that journey now from the old broken story that you picked up in childhood that that actually produced this one way of being in the world, this one-ish way of being in the world, toward embracing this new story, one that I just described? Okay, so two things come to mind that have been really pivotal for me in the last decade. Um, if I... Yeah. The first one is that I wrote a memoir about 10 years ago called Flunking Sainthood. And originally, Paraclete Press hired me to write a, one of the 365-day stunt memoirs where you try something for a year and then you write about it. It was very popular at, at that time. And they knew that, you know, because I write a column, they, they knew I could be funny if I wanted to be funny. And they wanted to have this be a bit on the lighter side have it be a book about reading about the lives of the saints and trying to reading spiritual classics and trying to sort of implement that in daily life. And, you know, very early on, I realized it would be totally boring for readers to read about someone reading, you know, that, that there had to be some kind of component about things to do. And so the book became about spiritual practice. And every month I would try a spiritual practice, often one that had been associated with a saint. Um, well, guess what? I started failing. And in 12 spiritual practices, well, actually, there were 13. One of them was such a terrible failure that I gave it up entirely. Uh, I failed at all of them to some degree. And my one response was to contact my editor and say, oh, crap, you know, this is not going as we had hoped it was. This is totally not what we expected. I should just give up. Um, and she pivoted immediately. And she said, you know, you should make it a book about spiritual failure. Call it Flunking Sainthood. And as soon as she said Flunking Sainthood, I thought, oh my gosh, that's exactly, exactly what it should be. And so I wound up writing a book about spiritual failure 
which for me was a huge leap, you know, mm-hmm. to admit failure in public, to, to write a book about all the things that you can't do, the fact that you can't sit down and have centering prayer because your mind is spinning in a kajillion different directions and you don't give away enough money to charity as much as you had thought you would and, and dreamed about in your head. Um, and then at the end of the book, I come to realize and could never have predicted this, that the father that I mentioned who had left when I was 14, uh, 26 years later, I get a call from a hospital in Mobile, Alabama, that they have this page, patient who is on life support mm. and they need a family member to come down there and authorize whether to have him live or die. I mean, it, it was something out of a television medical drama, but this whole thing out of nowhere, having had no contact for more than a quarter century, suddenly my dad shows up in my life again. Wow. Yeah. But what I came to realize and what, what's in the epilogue of the Flunking Sainthood memoir is that to some degree, all of those spiritual practices had taught me something and that they were helpful in that moment, you know, helpful also in recognizing the things about my father's life that I did not want to emulate in my life, um, but helpful in dealing with this terrible situation of, of having to make this decision and then mm-hmm. eventually having to kind of pick up the pieces of my dad's life, clean out his apartment, kind of learn what had happened to him in that quarter century. So writing Flunking Sainthood was the first thing, putting out a memoir in the world about failure. Wow. For me, that was a really big deal. And the second thing was a few years after that, I joined with a couple of friends of mine to do The Artist's Way. Uh, Are you familiar with this, Julia Mm -hmm. Cameron? Yes. And part of that is that every morning you're supposed to sit down and just write three pages. So it's called uh, morning pages and you do this however long it takes every day for, I think it was 12 weeks. And uh, that's when I found out that I was angry, right? Mm -hmm. I would have said, I'm not angry. I don't, I don't have things to be angry about. I have a very blessed life. I have a fantastic husband, you know, there's, what would I have to be angry about? But, oh my gosh, if you read my, uh, my, uh, my journal from that time, of morning pages, it is so angry. You know, she gives you these prompts of, it's about creativity and sort of recovering creativity. And she gives you these prompts to remember things that happened to you in childhood where maybe your creativity had been um, shunted, wounded in some way. And when I thought about that, I realized that I had been very creative as a child, but I had assumed this role of being the perfect kid the one who got good grades, the one who was afraid to try new things because I might not do it right, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that experience of doing the artist's way for 12 weeks, that's when I learned that I was actually angry. And that was hugely important for me as a one, because I think a lot of ones just deny that we're angry. And when we see that that is supposed to be, you know, this, this fixation of the one, well, (laughs) <laughs> that didn't ring true immediately for our, for my own experience, right? But it's true, I think, for a lot of us. And when we don't come to terms with that anger, that's when it becomes, a, you know, just destructive. We're unaware of the destruction that we are wreaking. Mm. We, in the story of you, we talk about uh, two things. And one you've already mentioned, right? One is a Jerry Contra, like, like that... Uh, as part of the healing journey, we want to begin to do the opposite of what our typical pattern of behavior or unhealthy behavior has been in the past. And that comes from St. Ignatius of Loyola, who presented this as, as a way of, uh, as a pathway to sainthood or a pathway to holiness, right? And um, you mentioned it when you're like being, you know, Kathy, when you are going against the grain of what you normally would do and <clears throat> as a way to, I guess, to temper um, or to neutralize the, the negative patterns of thinking and feeling and behaving. So there's one thing. And then we also sort of talk about how so much of the healing journey, the transformational journey into a new story is moving from our passion to our virtue. And here you've just sort of recognized that the passion of the one is anger. And oftentimes it's experienced by the one and others as resentment. And that resentment is toward people that do not live up to the high internal standards uh, of the one, 
people who are not as concerned with uh, fixing or or perfecting others in the world, right, or improving themselves, uh, and feeling too like they have to pick up the slack for people that aren't as concerned as they are with making things right all the time, right? And I just saw you smile when I said that. So, <laughs> yes, you know, and and so you know. Um, I think also there's the anger at the self, right? Ones are often just so angry and resentful toward themselves a lot of the time. Like, why can't I do this better? Why can't I do this right? Why, why am I not a, a, a better editor, mother, wife, um, partner, sister, dog, you, you know, on and on and on. And that's, that too generates anger and, and uh, resentment, right? But it's more inwardly focused. So there's a lot going on there for for the one and so moving toward the virtue of serenity tell me what that when i say that so much of the journey is moving from anger and resentment to the virtue of serenity what comes up for you mm. well years ago i was meeting with a spiritual director and she said this was we weren't really talking about the enneagram at this point but she said that what she had observed from the things that i was saying was that I needed serenity. And so she encouraged me to say the serenity prayer multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, God grant me the courage to change, uh, accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change those that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That for ones, I think, could be the foundational spiritual practice mm -hmm. of trying to cultivate serenity. You know, we can look at the world around us and see all of the flaws. This could be our... MO 24 seven, where we're just on the alert all the time for what's wrong in the world or what's wrong with ourselves or what's wrong with other people. And the gift of serenity is understanding, first of all, that you, you aren't bad, you know, that you are inherently good. That can be a game changer for ones, but understanding how little of the world is really yours to perfect, even mm. internally, you know, even within yourself, because that, you know, if you believe in God, you are pridefully sort of ignoring the possibility that God could be doing a work in you that isn't self-generated, you know, and that's a gift, that sort of grace, that grace could be at work in you. Wow. Ones could use some grace, you know. Mm. And isn't that true of all types? Because one of the things we wrote about in the story of you was this idea that the underlying premise of each of the stories of the nine types is in direct opposition to the story of grace. Yeah. Ever, isn't think, that amazing? I remember that the insight, the day I had that insight, I was like, wait a minute. Then that must be where our energy has to be focused. Like, mm -hmm. so if the, you know, I described the unconscious motivation of the one earlier, which is this need to be good and to perfect themselves, others in the world as a, as a sort of a mechanism or a strategy to be good. And, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's a, obviously a broken story. That is in direct opposition to the story of grace because you can be loved even in your imperfection. Yes, that is enormously important for ones to, I mean, most ones I think would say, if, if they are people of faith would say, oh yeah, I believe that, you know, but I don't know that a lot of us have internalized it. Certainly not when, when we're in times of stress and we feel like everything is ours to do, everything is falling apart, and it's up to us and only us to fix the world. Um, ones are called the improvers for a reason. You know, we are constantly seeking the way things could be better, but that's a heavy responsibility mm. that it feels good to just lay down. Mm. Jana, what is your primary practice to? Um, you know, to undo that broken story, that thought pattern as a one, because, because as someone I'm, you know, listening to you and these, even these books that you've written prior and the practices that you've put into place, uh, it seems prime that you would have a few go-tos um, to help you undo uh, the broken story of the one. So I'm going to say, I don't anymore have a daily spiritual practice and I'm going to say that out loud and not feel terrible about myself because that's the way things are. And, you know, even just a few years from ago, I probably would have not wanted you to know that, that I don't pray every day and I don't have a quiet time every day, not reading the scriptures every day, 
et cetera, et cetera. I do it when I need to. Mm. And actually that has been for me so much healthier because for ones, I think we, we can make a fixation out of order. We can make a fixation out of routine. And so for me, the joy of spirituality has been to kind of lay that down and to not have a regular fixed spiritual practice. Um, but for other people, it would be totally different. You know, that, that is only my, even for others, other ones, it might be mm. very different mm. of the ones that I don't do every day. <laughs> um, the Jesus prayer, it has been great. That is uh, essentially acknowledging that I'm a sinner. Um, I'm going to make mistakes and that the Lord Jesus Christ will have mercy on me no matter what. Mm. That's, um, that's huge. Ones, our mistakes to us are outsized. Our mistakes to us are the catastrophic, terrible failures of, of our moral center or terrible failures of our judgment. Um, and the ability to look at that in greater perspective is a huge gift for ones. Mm -hmm. Love that. So good. That is so good. You know, I am um, the first three steps of in the 12 steps, I think are healthy for everybody, but I think they're particularly maybe helpful for ones, but again, for everybody. The, the first one is admitted we were powerless mm. uh, over now we would say alcohol or drugs, but but I think people could say, well, first of all, I think everybody has an addiction. I could argue that your passion is an addiction, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that uh, we admitted we were powerless over life, mm -hmm. right? People, places, and things. We admitted we were powerless over people, places, and things, and that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, mm -hmm. people take exception to unmanageable, but really, if you think about how our lives go, they are unmanageable. Fa you know, we get a call that a father we haven't spoken to in 25 years is, is on life support. We, we, uh, our kids have a car accident, you know, or we, I mean, uh, we get a tax bill that's way over our head. I mean, you know, life is full of unmanageability, right? And for a one, man, the idea of unmanageability is really spooky, right? It's like, whoa, right? right? So the idea to say, I just admitted it. I'm, and you just did that then, you know, I don't have a spiritual mm -hmm. practice anymore. It's just, I just admit that that life is overwhelming. I'm powerless really in the face of life's challenges. It's I, my life feels un unmanageable and often intolerable. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the second step is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And, you know, for the, for the one, let's just face it, the belief that you could be perfect and you need to perfect others in the world and you have to have, <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> that's what they mean. And exhausting. <laughs> you know, and, and I could go through all nine types and, and show them how their way of thinking, acting, and feeling is insane. Right. Yeah. Right. It's just crazy. Right. And then that third step, which is, um, uh, we turned our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And I just think what you're describing is a little bit of that journey. And I wish that some did it with some intentionality. You know, I think to get up every day for every type and say, you know, I admit that, um, you know, I am powerless over people, places, and things, and that my life has become unmanageable. And then two, I, you know, I, I came to, I've come to believe that there is a, a personal loving uh, presence, power in the universe, call, call him, her, it, God, or whatever you choose, um, who uh, could really take over and, and help me live in this world, you know, and then turning that moment of surrender. And why do I say all this? Because I think if we can work through those steps in that order, we might arrive at serenity, the Oof. virtue of serenity. Good. Yeah. That's strong. Yeah. So I, I, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? I was like, well, let's try the first three steps of 12 step spirituality, because mm. I just think they just, one of the things I experienced and I, and I hear this all the time in meetings is that's when people experience peace for the first mm -hmm. time in their lives is when they just give up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm beaten. <laughs> 
And I just think that's so powerful, powerful, powerful when people do it. Can I make just a little observation because I, I don't want to let this go by and, and then I'd love to have your response on this, Ian, but I love that you said, Jenna, because I would make an argument that you haven't left your practice, but you actually moved to the high side of seven where you are experiencing the joy of God when mm-hmm. you practice your practice as opposed to the restraint of this thing you have to do every day. So I love just that sort of the arc or the transition of moving from that, uh, what looks like sort of the, the one Ian, um, into that high side of seven. What do you think about that? I love that. And I think that's, that's terrific. You know, um, sevens are not going to stick with something if it's boring or if it's <laughs> requiring, uh, you know, discipline, if it's not part of, of what their agenda is, which is having, you know, pleasure in their lives and enjoying life. Um, what ones can learn from that is that Discipline, while very important and you know necessary in many aspects of life, can also be very crippling. Mm-hmm. And we become slaves to these routines. We can do them for their own sake, just to check a box. And in terms of spirituality, I think there's a lot of box checking in many of our religions uh, without a lot of evaluation. How is this spiritual practice transforming my life or is it Mm -hmm. um it's just something that you have to do because it's on the list and a seven isn't going to stand for that right a seven is not going to take on a responsibility just because it's something on someone else's checklist Mm -hmm. and so when one goes to seven spiritually it is to evaluate what is bringing joy you know let's go there let's do more of that Mm -hmm. yeah it is so good i i um I have met many ones, as I'm sure you have, Anthony and Jana, who there's this kind of um, constricted um, grip. It's so tight. And what it does, whether it's on practices or doing the right thing all the time, you know, and it's what, what ends up happening is those practices become joyless duty. Yes. It's like, it's just dutiful. This is what you do to be dutiful and to be good as a Christian or whatever your background is. Uh, and they just become sapped of, of anything that feels life-giving. Uh, they just, as you said, tick the box, right? So I love that you, you're giving yourself the spontaneity and the freedom to say, you know, you know, I don't do this every day and that's okay. You know, um, and also, by the way, I think one of the great spiritual disciplines for ones is being in nature. Oh, mm. yes. Good. Because you can't perfect the trees. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. There's not a lot I can do. You know, there's no way to, no, you can't, you can't, you can't sweep the leaves and you know, it, it, you know, you, you just, and, and, and actually ones and nines, I find have a very powerful connection to nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think ones relax in nature. And and I I don't know if that's your experience or not, but there's just this kind of, ah, that, that one. Well, you know, think, think about what I just told you about when I was most relaxed as a kid. It was at camp, mm-hmm. right? So when else are you so fully enmeshed in all of the good and the bad and the ugly of the natural world? You're at camp. You, you've got everything beautiful and then all the mosquitoes and everything else, but it's invigorating and it's mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. And I probably as an adult don't do enough of that. Uh, my husband hates camping for one thing. So that's that's certainly part of it. But I think that uh, it's really good for me to have a dog. He's sitting right here behind me because I have to get out every day to walk the dog. Um, It's good for me too. It's just hugely important. Although I'm writing that I'm saying this right now and it's like 19 degrees outside. So I'm not totally looking forward to that walk (laughs) today, but it's good for us. Mm. Jana, this has been an incredibly rich conversation. I have so thoroughly loved it. And I knew it would be knowing you and and knowing how well versed you are in not only in the Enneagram, but in life. You're you're well versed in life. We've had many conversations and uh, about our personal lives. And I've always been impressed with your spirituality and your self-knowledge and the way that you apply it. And you know, uh, I've I've uh, you know. I feel so grateful that we worked on the story of you together, this last book, because as you know, it was a slog. Writing is always a slog. Uh, This one was for, you know, a whole host of reasons, but 
you know, uh, I do see the new story in you. And I mm. see it's it's ongoing development and it's unfolding because as you know, right, stories unfold. And that's the, the beauty, I think, of what we've heard today. And uh, how do people learn more about what you're doing? Tell them about your books, uh, how they can find an incredible editor. I'm always referring authors to you. Tell me, tell me about, tell folks about that. Well, the editing stuff, um, I have an author website, which is just janareese.com. It's R-I-E-S-S.com. And the front page is the books that I've written, but then you can also click on editing services and be taken to the page, which describes what I'm available to do as an editor. And thank you, by the way, for all those referrals, because not only have I gotten uh, excellent referrals from you, but they've been really fun people to work with. Mm -hmm. And that means a lot to me. Um, that that's just a fantastic gift to have such great authors to work with. Um, recently, you know, I have a doctorate and my doctorate is in the history of religion in America, but recently my scholarly work has taken a turn to social science. So I'm, instead of studying dead people, I'm studying living people and working with other social scientists to do surveys about religion in America, particularly about Mormonism. And so that's my tradition. Um, and the one that we're working on right now is about people who have left Mormonism. Why did they leave? And some of the things that we've been talking about, which, you know, this perfectionism, the checklist culture, a lot of that has resonance with many people in my tradition, and particularly people who, who do wind up leaving. And so some of your audience, maybe who are evangelical Christians, can kind of resonate with that, too. Yeah, we, we should have a conversation sometime. I, I have some contact with the Mormon community and just that whole idea of public goodness of, yeah. you know, of needing to be good, being the exemplar of that at work. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I don't know anybody who's had a Mormon employee who wanted to get rid of them. <laughs> you know, well, we pride ourselves on that, you know, maybe to a fault that that sense of having to be a model minority, a model religious minority, ones feel very at home often mm -hmm. in the space of Mormonism, because it's a culture that a subculture that rewards us for even some of the traits that we take to extremes, this idea of it being our responsibility to make the world a better place. And that is a great thing. I mean, I, I'm a Mormon for a reason, right? but it can also be taken too far. Mm. Well, Jenna, again, thank you for, for being on Typology. Thanks for being my friend. Thanks for being my editor. Uh, the story of you thank would you. not be what it is without you. And of course, the road back to you, of course. And, and uh, I just want to remind our Typology listeners, may you have love, may you have joy, may you have peace, may you have healing, and may you have rest. Until next time.